Coca-Cola's history starts all the way back in the late 19th century with a man known as Dr. John Stiff Pemberton, a hustling chemist and pharmacist who served as a Confederate soldier during the American Civil War. Before the war commenced, Pemberton was a licensed medic of Thompsonian medicine, which combined the principles of herbal medicine and botany to cure the body of any harmful toxins. And let us tell you that a lot of the public looked at this form of medical practice with suspicion. Yet, Pemberton still went on to study and practice his craft successfully before eventually going on to get a degree in pharmacy at a school in Philadelphia, shortly before the Civil War broke out in 1861. But before you assume that this is a story of magnificent experimental discovery, it isn't. Here's a warning. Things are about to get a little grim. As we mentioned before, Pemberton served in the army and braved multiple battles. Among one of these was one that scarred him for life, the Battle of Columbus in April 1865. He endured a saber wound to the chest, which nearly proved fatal. And while Pemberton managed to live, he was left with unimaginable chronic pain. And what followed after that was a losing battle against crippling morphine addiction, which caretakers and doctors prescribed as a painkiller to him. And this is where Coca-Cola was essentially born. According to the Coca-Cola company, Pemberton created the syrup for the famous drink, which was tested at the local Jacobs Pharmacy and was presumed to be fantastic. The syrup in question was mixed with calibrated water to create a new drink that was flavorful and refreshing. Pemberton apparently made the two-date secret Coca-Cola formula in a three-legged, rusty old brass kettle in his yard. Relying on the skill and knowledge he had collected in his professional tenure, Pemberton set out to find a cure to his addiction. He began experimenting with various herbs and plants. This included occasionally dabbling with coca leaf, which is the most fundamental element used in manufacturing cocaine. And so, he basically mixed together cocoa leaves, cola nuts for the added caffeine to kick, and some wine. This was essentially the first Coca-Cola prototype Pemberton created, or more commonly known as the French wine coca. The beverage, which is marketed as a painkiller, antidepressant, and interestingly, an aphrodisiac, worked to help soften Pemberton's intensity of his morphine addiction, and as a result, it was then sold to the public, where it instantly became a household favorite. And now that we have the primary history out of the way, let's take a look at the intriguing nomenclature of the product and its identity. The Coca-Cola name was suggested by Frank Robinson who was one of Pemberton's bookkeepers. By now, you probably have an idea of where we're going with this, but we're going to spell it out for you, don't worry. As the syrup's recipe combined the coca leaf extract and caffeine content from the cola nut, the moniker Coca-Cola was rather obvious to come up with. However, Robinson was most acclaimed for his creative penmanship, thought that using the letter C in the name in a flow would be more marketable. And as a result, Cola with a K became Cola with a C, and the brand was launched. Robinson may also be credited with pinning down the first Coca-Cola logo typeface that uses flowing letters. The original soft drink was initially distributed to the public at a soda fountain in the Jacobs Pharmacy in Atlanta sometime in 1886. Nearly nine servings of the carbonated beverage were sold each day. The initial annual sales profit came up to something around $50. And while the first year of business wasn't much of a roaring success, it cost Pemberton over $70 in expenses to create the drink, with him going in a negative balance. This was before it exploded on the scene. Because sometimes, what an artist needs is the business acumen of an entrepreneur. It was 1887 when another Atlanta pharmacist and businessman, Asa Candler, bought and acquired a secret Coca-Cola formula from Pemberton for just $2,300. Fast forward a few years, and by the late 1890s, Coca-Cola became a sensation, becoming one of the cornerstones of America's popular fountain drinks. This was, of course, due to Candler's on-the-nose marketing of the product. With Candler now taking charge of the marketing and sales, the Coca-Cola company increased its syrup sales by over 4,000% over the next 10 years. Isn't that crazy? But some conspiracy theorists suggest that there was more to this than met the eye. That the company didn't just pawn off of excessive marketing 
it had, well, other methods, plausibly addictive substances. And while of course, the Coca-Cola company denied and to date still does deny this claim, historical evidence illustrates that it is likely that until the early 1900s, the soft drink, which is advertised as a tonic, contained hints of cocaine content as well as a caffeine-intense cola nut. Interestingly, cocaine wasn't considered illegal until 1914, according to Live Science. And it wasn't until then that Candler began replacing cocaine from the recipe in the early 1900s. However, traces of cocaine may have been present in the famous beverage until the 1930s, when scientists were able to successfully remove all psychoactive elements from the coca leaf nectar. And before we knew it, Coca-Cola was being sold across the entire North America. Around the same time, the company began selling its syrup variant in independent bottling enterprises, licensed to sell and distribute the drink. Even today, the US soft drink industry is organized on this particular tenant. Moving on, in the 1960s, we saw a change in culture. The fountain soda was being replaced by the bottler one. Since both small town and big city people enjoyed these carbonated beverages at the local soda fountain or ice cream parlor, people took it for their communal pastime. Often seen stacked in the drugstore, the soda fountain counter served as a rendezvous point for people of all ages. Often coupled with lunch counters, the soda fountain began declining in popularity as commercial ice cream, bottled soft drinks, and fast food restaurants began gaining momentum. And this was where Coca-Cola's own internal issues started. On April 23rd of 1985, the trade secret, the brand's new Coke, formula was debuted in response to a declining sales margin thanks to a ragingly competitive cola market. However, the new recipe was considered a massive, catastrophic failure. Coca-Cola enthusiasts had a negative, some say even hostile, reaction to the new flavor. And within a quarter of the year, the original cola that resonated in the hearts and taste buds of the public made its comeback. The return of the OG Coke flavor came with a fresh branding of Coca-Cola Classic. The new Coke remained stocked on the shelves and in 1992 it was once again rebranded as Coke 2 before finally being put out of commission in 2002. As of today, Coca-Cola is a publicly traded Fortune 500 company with around $40 billion in annual revenue and a net worth of an estimated $286 billion. In 1969, the Coca-Cola company and its advertising partners, McCain Erickson, concluded their infamous Things Go Better with Coke campaign, replacing it with a campaign that centered It's the Real Thing. Beginning with a super hit anthem, the new campaign featured what was to be one of the most popular ads ever aired. Moreover, the song, I'd Like to Buy the World a Coke, was the invention of Bill Backer, the creative director of Coca-Cola at the time. Without a doubt, songwriters Billy Davis and Roger Cook did justice to the iconic anthem. After all, he had instructions to give. I could see and hear a song that treated the whole world as if it were a person a person the singer would like to help and get to know. Having just the last line in mind, he pulled out the paper napkin on which he hurriedly scribbled the catchphrase, I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. In 1971, I'd like to buy the world a Coke was sent to radio stations throughout the United States. Much to everyone's surprise, it bombed. The Coca-Cola bottlers despised them and most refused to purchase any airtime for it. The few times the ad was played, the public didn't even bat an eye. Backer, however, still had hope. He persuaded McCain to get the Coca-Cola executives on board, telling them that the ad was still quite viable but needed a solid visual representation. The company eventually commissioned more than $250,000 for their production, which at the time was one of the largest budgets ever allocated to a television commercial meant to just be viewed for mere seconds. It worked though, because soon Coca-Cola and its bottlers were on the receiving end of more than 1 million letters about the commercial. Today, advertising surveys routinely identify it as one of the best adverts ever made, and the original music composition continues to sell more than 30 decades after the song was materialized. It's safe to say that Coke, without a doubt, 
has been the front runner in taste and entertainment. And that's all we have for today, folks. Make sure to give this video a thumbs up. See you in the next video. Until then, ciao.